equation that has four variables in it, but we're going to start with just two variables and we'll add the other two later. But this fellow named Mr. Emery Lane, he was a hydrologist with the uh, Bureau of Reclamation and they did a lot of really intensive hydrologic studies back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And so he came up with, uh, with this relationship which can be pictured by this balance. In its most simple form, it's really intuitive. And it's simply that W for water, the discharge of water in a channel, or the flow of water in a channel, and on this side, S for sediment. Could be silt, could be sand, could be gravel, or whatever. And that these two exist in a sort of an equilibrium if a creek is functioning properly. If everything's in balance, then these two are in balance. Okay, it's pretty easy. Anybody can see that if additional water is added to a channel, whatever the, however that might happen, if additional water is added to a channel, what's the response? Over here is the response. Well, obviously it's going to erode. More water, more energy, you're going to have erosion. That's just a natural uh, cause and effect. On the other hand, if something's happening in the watershed, let's say big time, let's just say a big time mining, uh, something that adds a lot of sediment, or it could be construction. So if, if a lot of sediment is added to the river without a corresponding increase in water, then obviously it's going to set up the balance this way. Too much sediment, not enough water to move the sediment, and so it's going to set up for deposition. Well, that's, that's all pretty easy. Too much water causes erosion. Too much sediment causes it to build up. In a creek or a river that's, that we say is balanced, that doesn't mean it's locked right in the middle. It's locked in place. Even a natural channel that's in balance is going to be doing this. It's going to be rocking back and forth like two kids on a seesaw. It's not perfectly 100% balanced all the time. But because it's moving back and forth and it's compensating, erosion is compensating for deposition, it sort of does this and everything is still natural and, and good and it's all functioning properly. That part so far is easy to understand. But Mr. Lane, he had four variables in his model, not just two. And so the other two parts of his equation was that he added the slope of the channel over here, whether it's a flat channel or a steep channel, and on this side was the size of the sediment. In other words, gravel is bigger than sand. Sand is bigger than clay. It's harder for water to move gravel than it is for it to move sand. Well, y'all y'all know that. It's kind of that's kind of intuitive. But now you can begin. By playing with this, we can see what happens when any of those four variables change. And then how does the, the, the interesting part is how does the creek or the river correct for that disturbance? And so uh, we'll take one easy example here. This would be one, for example, where let's just say, for example, the, uh, the watershed of... Uh, the Nueces or the Frio or the Sabinal is heavily overgrazed. And that, of course, that, and that's happened. And so what happens on a watershed when it's heavily grazed? What, is there more water goes in or less into the channel? More water. Okay, so you're adding more water to the channel. And it doesn't have to be much more, and bingo. Okay, it sets it up for erosion. And that's what happens. It either cuts down down, down, like she showed, or the channel cuts wider, wider, wider. It, it, it erodes the channel. How is nature going to fix that? Nature fixes that. One of the primary ways that that would be compensated for would be that the slope of the channel, now just move this over one notch and maybe two notches, and then all of a sudden, it rebalances. So too much water causes erosion and 
the adjustment that the river makes or can make is it flattens its slope, a flatter slope, less energy, less erosion. Now here's the question. How in the world does a river flatten its slope? Yeah, there she It wiggles. It meanders. You remember the graph that she showed that the more that a channel meanders in the valley, the flatter the slope gets. And do have you noticed rivers and creeks uh, either either increasing or de decreasing their meandering in your lifetimes? In increasing. Typically. They'll do that. Yeah. They cut on the outside bend. They deposit on the inside bend. So you actually have more creek compressed inside that valley. And so creeks do frequently meander in order to flatten the slope. I mean, it's not like they have a mind, but you'd almost think they do because these are just natural laws and natural cause and effects. Likewise, if you do the opposite, you know, if, if, if a river is dewatered, which is what y'all are experiencing, not enough water, not enough water to move sediment, it sets it up for deposition. And there's a lot of creeks in Texas that uh, are, are what we call uh, depositing uh, reaches of creeks and rivers. We see it up in the hill country, we see it down here. So instead of eroding the channel, it's filling it up, filling it up with mud, gravel. And so the answer to that is just the opposite of the previous one, is that rivers and creeks will steepen their own slope, and they do that the same way, but instead of increasing the meandering, they start cutting, they take shortcuts across those big bends. And if you look at aerial photographs of a lot of creeks over time, if you look at a set of photographs from the 1950s, the 60s, the 70s, you'll see that sometimes rivers will put big bends into their channel, and other times those bends will they'll take a shortcut through it and they'll take the bend out. Have y'all seen have y'all seen that? No, it's good. And so that's just the natural way that rivers and creeks can fix themselves due to these natural processes. We could go into other examples uh, on sediment size. Uh, one would be if you had a river system and let's say one of the tributaries into that creek had its headwaters back in the hills and there was some big disturbance up there. It could be construction, it could be mining, it could be something that was delivering larger sized gravel and cobble into that channel and it started going down there and so if, <coughs> if the size of the sediment incre increases, so we're going from fine sediment to coarse, and let's say it drops it over a notch or two, bingo, you're back into a deposition phase because that same amount of water cannot move the cobble. It can move the clay, it can move silt, maybe it can move sand, but it can't move gravel. So the gravel starts piling up, piling up, piling up. And so we really, you can't just snap your fingers and say, well, we need more water to move that sediment out. And so again, the, the, the creek could respond by steepening, maybe one more, steepening its grade by straightening itself out. It's not, that, it's not that a bulldozer straightens it out, it's that the river straightens itself out. Instead of going through all those meanders, it starts taking shortcuts across those meanders. And so virtually anything that would happen in a watershed or to a channel can be sort of explained. It's sort of predictable what these creeks do and how they try to fix themselves. Now, Mr. Lane, he was a hydrologist. He knew about water. He knew about sediment. He did not have vegetation as part of his thinking about a creek or a river, but here's how we would incorporate vegetation into this model. Rubber bands, 
something that takes the shock out of those extreme uh, changes, you saw how rapidly that balance changed with just a small addition of water. Vegetation acts like a shock absorber to, would to your truck or a buffer. And so it doesn't change the relationship, but it does change the severity. Instead of that thing swinging, boom, way over there, or boom, way over here, it just takes, the, it takes some of the uh, energy out of those big swings. It buffers the, the changes. We could add more gravel from whatever kind of disturbance, and it's still going to have the same cause and effect. But it's not going to be a big, heavy swing. It's going to be a cushioned swing. And then, so that's how we would incorporate vegetation into this Mr. Lane's model. And of course, the more rubber bands you put on, the more vegetation, the more protection, the more bu uh, buffering. And so good vegetation will uh, reduce the severity of these wild swings, so either the erosion swing or the deposition swing. And so it took this, I'm, by training, I'm a wildlife biologist. I don't understand, I'm not a hydrologist, I don't understand engineering, but this did help me to sort of see uh, how this stuff works. And 